Hello everyone, my name is Marsha and I'm the founder and director of Fuck Up Nights Toronto. I'm super excited to be here today for this Facebook Live with the amazing Barry Krakauer. Um, I'm going to do a little bit of an intro to Barry in a bit, but first a little bit about myself and Fuck Up Nights Toronto. So Fuck Up Nights Toronto is part of a global movement, global community that was started in Mexico City. Today happens in over 300 cities all over the world. And our whole premise is to share stories of failure. So we bring out amazing entrepreneurs, professionals, people from all different walks of life, and they share their biggest fuck ups. Um, now with these times of social distancing, unfortunately, we can't do our normal monthly in-person events. And we decided to change up the format a little bit just to really be um, on theme and bring value um, to our community that's tuning in live. So usually our talks feature um, a speaker really sharing their fuck up in around 10 minutes and sharing 10 images. Today we're going to be doing a more in-depth AMA and you're going to have an opportunity to ask your questions. This is totally interactive. We want to see your comments. We want to see your questions and let us know where you're tuning in from. Are you in Toronto? Are you in a different part of the world? Um, let us know. We definitely want to know in the comments. So before I introduce Barry, I want to say a huge thank you to our lead partner, uh, which is Zero Accounting. In these times today, if you're a small business, if you're an entrepreneur, you really need to be staying on top of your cash flow. And the best way to do so is through using cloud accounting software. Zero makes running your business um, really easy, beautiful, and has a really amazing platform for cloud accounting. So definitely check it out. We're going to post it in the comments. Um, and yeah, thank you again for being our lead partner and for making our community possible. So today I'm super excited to have Barry with me. Barry is actually the founder of Rexall, which is a brand that you all recognize, I'm sure. Um, but he has extensive experience in the retail industry. Um, he actually started Canada's very first computer store and has had so many other roles and so many cool things that he's done throughout his entrepreneurial journey and his career. Um, with Fuck Up Nights, you know, I don't like to read out a bio. That's something you could totally find online yourself. We are going to post it in the comments just so you can read it. But we like to introduce our speakers with a few fun facts or one fun fact. So Barry, welcome, first of all, to the Fuck Up Nights Toronto stage. Thank you. Um, Thank you so much for joining us today and for being so open and willing to share your fuck ups along your journey. So can you tell us something that people can't find out about you online, a fun fact? Okay, I don't know if it's a fun fact, but it's something that you probably would not read in my bio. <clears throat> this, I, I'm gonna tell you a little story that happened and I think by telling the story, you'll learn a little bit about me and a little bit about the time that I was your, <clears throat> your age more or less and how different the environment was. I started my career after university at the Canadian General Electric. And um, General Electric then, it's not as, uh, uh, as big and as, as uh, influential as it was back then, but back then there were, company, there were uh, GE uh, organizations all around the world, all kinds of companies around the world owned by General Electric. And once a year, the top executives of General Electric met in one location and met with the board. And each CEO of every country was able to bring one up and comer with him or her. I was the up and comer from Canada and we met in Florida. And um, I remember there were about 300 of us in the auditorium and the board was on the stage and they told us all about the wonderful things the company was doing. And then they asked for questions. I naturally put up my hand and my CEO, my boss, my friend, who I still see to this day, got a little bit nervous when he saw me putting up my hand. I asked the chair of GE and the board, I said, are all of these people the top executives in General Electric around the world? And they said, yes. I said, how come of the 300 people, there are no blacks in the room? Now this gives you an indication of times being different back then, which was in the early 70s. They gave me the proper answer, which was true. And that was the General Electric was one of the leaders 
in recognizing anybody who had ability, and it didn't matter their, their religion or their, or their color. Uh, and what they said, the answer they gave me was basically, there are a lot of people on, on the second rung, and they're in the process of moving up, and we have no prejudices whatsoever. Immediately after that meeting broke up, we walked out to the pool where we had a cocktail party, and you would think that I had coronavirus because very few people <laughs> came over to me. By the time the meeting was over, we befriended one another once again, but I thought I would tell that story because it tells a little bit about my personality and my principles, as well as how different times were not that long ago. Maybe it seems long ago to you guys, but it doesn't seem long ago to me. That's, that's my so-called fun fact. <laughs> I love that. That's, <laughs> that's probably the longest fun fact that we've heard <laughs> on the Fuck Up Nice Toronto stage, but I love it. That's, that's a really great story. And it's crazy how much times have changed and how much they're changing now. And, you know, it's, the world is constantly evolving. So today we're going to dive into your entrepreneurial journey. We're going to find out how you started your first business. And of course, with this being Fuck Up Nights Toronto, we're really going to focus on the failures along the way and the lessons that you learned from them, which I think are so much more important. With Fuck Up Nights, we really preach this um, mantra of failing mindfully, you know, not just failing fast, but really taking the time to think through your failure, to reflect on it. And more importantly, share it with the world and help others learn from it. So Barry, again, thank you so much for joining me and for being so open and willing to share um, all of your fuck ups along your journey. So to get started, um, let's take us back to the beginning of your entrepreneurial journey. Um, you decided to start um, the very first um, computer store in Canada. What did that idea look like for you and what was your grand vision for it and why did you even get into that in the first place? Well, it's very interesting. My brother, this was in 19, if I remember correctly, 1989, which is not that far back. But at that point in time, my brother was on the advisory council of Apple, believe it or not. And he really believed in the future of computers, specifically Apple for individual people, not necessarily for businesses, for the computer use, use in the home. I know that sounds ridiculous at this point in time, but at that point in time, very few people had computers in their house. And he got the idea that we should open up the first computer store in Canada. He had the experience with computers, I didn't. We rented a space on Steeles Avenue, just east of the, uh, of the 400. And we called it the Steels people, S-T-E-A-L-S, for obvious reasons. And at that point in time, IBM owned the computer uh, business, as far as portable computers, laptops, or desktops. However, at that time, there were clones. I don't know if people listening or, or viewing this are familiar with the term clones. These were companies primarily in China and Japan that were producing computers, knockoffs of IBM. And that's what people were basically buying in the store. We had a clone on the counter, and we had an IBM on the counter. The price of the clone was 50% of the price of the IBM, and it had a one-year warranty, whereas the IBM had a 30-day warranty. And that was our plan, to start off by selling computers and advertising that we had computers that did the same thing as IBM for half the price. But I didn't get involved with my brother. I helped him from a marketing point of view. But I continued to do what I was doing. And he kept saying, you have to join me. This is going to be terrific. This was in October. Can't believe that I remember the month. But this was in October. And we ran the first ad. And I was in the showroom where I was working at the time. I was part of Dilex, which owned all kinds of retail stores at that time. And he called me and he said, Barry, you won't believe this. I just arrived at the store. This was 8.30 in the morning. And he says, there's a lineup that goes around the building. And he says, you've got to join me. I said, Howard, let's, let's, let's wait a little while because, you know, this is the first day you've had an ad in the paper. Of course, it's going to be a lot of people are going to attend. Anyway, I'm going to make a long, very long story short. This was the first day. The second day and the third day, the line was just as long. This was in October. November was bigger than October. December was Christmas, and everything went through the roof. We had, he called me in December, and he says, Barry, you, 
you've got to come over here. I've got a problem. I said, what's the problem? He said, the lineup is as long as it's ever been. We literally have nothing on the shelf. The place was empty. And that was how we started the store. And as a result of that, I joined and we became somewhat more sophisticated. And we opened up six stores. And they were the equivalent of what today is, um, um, what's it called? Business Depot. Staples. Yeah. We were the first. They were, I don't know if, you, if everybody on the phone can relate to square footage, but we had like 14,000 square feet. And we had everything that Staples would have, primarily for computers. And we were, and we spent a lot of money on advertising, a lot of promotion. And after we opened the sixth store, we were breaking even and we were doing $30 million a year. This was in 1989. That's wow. And that was big at that time. And we had, a, a, when we opened the store, we borrowed the money from an individual, a very wealthy individual who owned 50% of the store and we would pay him back as we went along and he would reduce his ownership down to nothing. That was the plan. One Friday, we receive a letter in the mail. This is what relates to fuck up, by the way. We received yeah. <laughs> a registered letter in the mail saying that he withdrew his funds and the bank was coming in on Monday morning to close us down. Oh, wow. So And we lost the entire business. I was stiff one at the time. I had three kids and, and, a, and a mortgage, and all my money was in the business. I think it was my brother. And that was the fuck up. I think... Take us, take us back to that moment. Did you, did you see it coming at all? Were there any red flags? Or even when you decided to do business with, with that investor, did nothing. anything, like, was your gut telling you that it was, it was the right person? or Nothing. There was no indication whatsoever. The reason this individual withdrew his funds is because he had a major business in Quebec, which wasn't doing very, very well, and he needed the money. That's beside the point. But so we didn't see it coming. And the next stage, which I think you might find interesting, or maybe your viewers won't find interesting, is if anybody asks me what my major accomplishment is in life, and I don't have very many major accomplishments, but the one that I continue to think about is how I got out of this and how, and how I felt and what I did and what I now look back on as not only a major accomplishment, but how I grew as an individual because of this very unfortunate situation. I mean, that's, that's really the key to, to failure. It really, a lot of the time, if you take the time to really learn from the lessons and to kind of use it as something that's going to help propel you forward and it's going to make you stronger as an individual, as an entrepreneur, or as a professional, if, if, that's, what, if that's the route that you decide to take. Right. So what did those initial um, days look like for you, you know, after this happened, take us to that moment, you know, it must have been so tough with, you know, everything being invested in this business, having a mortgage, having, having a family, uh, what was going through your mind those first few days when you realized that this was, this was a failed? Um, it was nothing, it was nothing less than a total shock. Because it never even occurred to me that I wouldn't have a business or a job. I mean, that was unheard of when I was growing up and after university, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I didn't even have time to think. The following day, I mentioned they closed the place on Monday. The following day was Tuesday. I got up at my regular time early in the morning and I decided there's no way that I can stay home. I've got to do something. And by the way, I immediately went to work out and I've been working out every day since then. That's what first time I went to work out. But what I did after that is something that I'm sure many of your viewers have done or are doing or should do if they're ever faced with this kind of a situation. And that is, you're probably familiar with the term, it's called networking. Yes. <laughs> and at that time, networking, I don't even know if that phrase was used in those days, but that's what it was. However, rather than just making phone calls, what I did is, and I spent a lot of years prior to that in marketing. So I, I, I produced, a business card with my name and my phone number and I put on there that I was a marketing consultant and I started I made a list of all of the people who I knew and I started calling them and I wasn't calling them to get a position I was calling them to tell them what my background was I didn't spend very much time talking about the, the steels people what I told them was I I'm getting into the consulting business 
And what I'd like you to do, if you don't mind, is introduce me to some people who might be able to use my services. That's how I went about doing that for about two months. And that leads into where I went to next, which relates to Rexall, but uh, I'll drop it at that point in time. Yeah, that's, I mean, networking is so key and really realizing that it's a two-way street. You know, you can't just um, network for the sake of networking and really just to try to get um, value from others. You really have to offer something in return and really build a relationship. And it really sounds like you went about it the right way. Um, what were some of the key lessons that you learned from, from your experience, from that failure, looking back on it? Is there anything at all that you would have done differently? Is there anything you think you, you could have done to kind of save that business? Or? No, I, I, don't, I don't usually say that what I've done has been the right thing to do. But in this case, and it wasn't by plan, I realized how important it was to come across as though you really had self-confidence without being arrogant. And that's what I did at every meeting that I went to. I didn't imply that I was having difficulty. I certainly didn't mention my previous experience unless they asked me for that. I didn't tell any lies. But by talking like I really felt that I could be a very effective marketing consultant, somehow that message got across. And now to this day, if anybody asks me, and very few people do, but if they asked me, what's the most important uh, characteristic or quality a person should have in their career, it's my opinion, it's self-confidence. I think that you have to have experience, you have to have knowledge, you have to have the kind of personality that's applicable to whatever career you've selected, but all of that requires self-confidence. If you don't have self-confidence, but you know what you're qualified to do, you can't communicate it effectively without that self-confidence. So that's what I got out of that experience. And that's what stood me in, or has stood me in good stead until now. That's a fantastic tip. I think, you know, a lot of the time it's kind of easier said than done. And I'm sure a lot of people who are tuning in right now, maybe they're going through something like this, just with the situation that we're all in. You know, a lot of us have been laid off or our businesses are, you know, taking a big hit with what's going on. And it's hard to kind of project that self-confidence when you're really at the lowest point in your life. Right. A lot of the time, what is there anything that kind of stands out that helped you do that? Was it your support system? Uh, was it kind of like giving yourself a pep talk and your routines or no. anything that you, yeah. can, you can? I wouldn't listen to myself. I wouldn't <laughs> listen to my pep talk. But I'll tell you what, what I really believe, how, how it was helpful for me. And I, I think it can be helpful for many of the people who might be viewing, listening or, or watching this particular conversation. And that is, in selecting a career, it has to be the kind of career that you really, really want to pursue. Not just something that your friend is doing and you'd like to do that kind of thing or whatever. It has to be something you really like to do. And that has to relate to what you think you're capable of doing. So if you select the career and you believe you're capable and have the knowledge and or the experience to do it, that will enable you to develop self-confidence because how can you have self-confidence in a career that sounds terrific but that's not really your first choice or it's not really what you've studied or what you've experienced so that's that's whatever guidance that is that i would provide that guidance for somebody to develop self-confidence not to develop they would have it they would yeah. have it. For sure, especially I think that's so applicable just like to the realm that I was in before Fuck Up Nights and a lot of my roles were in, in, in marketing and, you know, I had to be passionate about what I was working on. And I think that that applies to anyone, any industry or any type of business that you're trying to get into. If you're not passionate about it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to show and it's not going to be authentic and it's not going to be a great experience for you or for anyone else involved. Yeah. Um, how did you lean on your support system? during that failure was it i think you know during those times it was probably there was probably a lot of stigma around failure and around the admitting um defeat and you know being an entrepreneur it wasn't glamorized at all um back in those times um how did you kind of lean on the people that were close to you yeah well this is going to sound corny but fortunately my wife was in a major support she always was positive everything was going to work out don't worry about it uh, and i think she was quite sincere um, and I think, obviously, if you have a partner, excuse me, if you have a partner, it's very important that that partner 
is a support. In other words, shares whatever you think you're capable of doing in a positive way. So that's one of the most important support uh, supports, if you will. Yeah. As far as friends, all my friends, all my friends, I don't have that many friends, but the few friends that I had, they were totally supportive, had confidence in me and said, don't worry. And I think they were sincere. Yeah. You know, if anybody's going through difficult times, everybody tells them, don't worry, it'll work out. That's a normal thing to do. And then you shake hands, but maybe not during these days, but you <laughs> shake hands and go your own way. But um, uh, they were sincere and that helped. And that helped. And the worst thing that you could do is uh, complain. In other words, nobody wants to hear what your problems are, including your best friends and your wife or your husband or your partner. Yeah, that's that's really great advice. So, you know, leaning on people, but I guess not overburdening them with, with your problems and, you know, really being respectful of them as well. So let's continue on on your entrepreneurial journey. So you started networking and really um, putting yourself out there as a marketing consultant. How did how did that sort of lead to your next role? And, um, and tell us um, a little bit more about the journey to Rexall. Well, when I was with General Electric, part, prior to joining my brother, <clears throat> excuse me, I was vice president of consumer products, which is refrigerators and stoves and you know toaster ovens, etc. And I was, uh, as I say, with General Electric, and I I knew all of the other vice presidents of General Electric, and one of the one of the vice president of General Electric at the time was VP for um, strategy. Very good guy, but had the kind of person who didn't manage a business because nobody would work for him. So he, he asked General Electric, is it okay? One of the companies, he, one of the divisions that he was in the process of creating, he asked the CEO, is it okay if I run that company? And the CEO said, I'm sorry, Michael, you're terrific. We need you, but we don't think you can do that. So Michael immediately quit and bought a company, a public company, uh, at that time, it had uh, met and he had partners. Uh, and one of the one of the well, one of the pro uh, partners were the Bronfman family, and they had this large company. He couldn't get along with the Bronfmans. He left that, used his money to buy another company. That company had many divisions. One of its divisions, I, I'm doing that very quickly because I don't want to get involved in all that stuff. But one of the companies that he bought had drugstores. Those drugstores were in uh, the equivalent of today's Walmart. Uh, in those days, it uh, was called Wilco. I don't know if anybody remembers Wilco, but Wilco was the, the, the forerunner of, of Walmart. So he had all of the drugstores in Wilco. They weren't called anything because there was uh, like another department within Wilco, but he owned them. And they weren't doing very well. And he was one of the people that I called for networking. And when I got there, he said, oh, you're just the guy I want to see, because he knew that I had retailing experience. He didn't. And he said, I'd like you to cross the country, <clears throat> look at all of those stores and tell me what you think. So I did. And I came back. And I remember making a, pres a verbal presentation to him and his chair of the board, who I also knew very well. And, and I told him that the first thing is you have a, you have a CEO who's a zero. He's, he reads the newspaper all day. <laughs> As I'm making the presentation, he's walking out of the room. Michael is walking out of the room. I said, well, look, I'm making a presentation. You paid me for it. He said, I said, where are you going? He said, I'm going to get rid of the CEO. I said, you can't do that. <laughs> anyway, he did. by the time it we reached noon, I was the CEO of, of this total company and the CEO of this drugstore chain. Um, and I came home. My wife didn't believe it because I was in the process of networking. But for the, next, uh, for the next two years, my son, who is the same age as most of you guys on, on the uh, video, would tell his friends how proud he was of his father. Because in a matter of two years, I took 180 locations and brought it down to three. <laughs> so he was being sarcastic. <laughs> the fact of the matter is, those stores were making no money. I took those three stores, I redid them, I called them Rexall. I went forward from that. I bought one store at a time for the next eight years, all across the country. And I'm not going to go into how I went about that, 
but it was very, very exciting. And those stores grew into whatever number of stores they had today. And I retired, I guess, uh, uh, actually, it's about, it's 18 years ago that I retired. And at that time, we had 200 stores. That's, that's incredible. Uh, we do have some time to kind of get into the nitty gritty of that a little bit more. Um, so tell us, how did you, um, how did you strategize about picking those locations and um, how did you make those decisions about which stores to close, which ones to kind of, you know, try to revive or, you know, how did you kind of evaluate the failure there and um, go about those decisions? Well, what I did in those days, uh, there of course was Shoppers and there was another chain out west and another chain in, in Quebec called Jean Coutier, uh, but there were the major chains and here I started it off with three stores and what I would do is I would by car by plane by train I would go into small com communities across the country and in every community probably until this day I'm not sure but I went into every community and I found the drugstore and I walked in total cold call and I know that the pharmacist was a very important person in every city in every small community and I walked in and I said, uh, I introduced myself and I said, I'd like to buy your store out of nowhere. He thought I was coming for a prescription. And to make a long story short, for those who are on, on the video and you're familiar with, with, with numbers and with uh, uh, how you go about valuing a, a purchase of a company, my objective was to buy these stores at four times earnings, which is like a joke today, but four times earnings. And what I said to the guy who wasn't interested to start off with, but I wound up with a coffee next door at the coffee shop with him. I, I told him, I said, I will buy the store for four times your earnings. I told him that, that depends how much they were earning. And I will, and you continue to run it with your same employees. And I will give you 10% of the profit. And you run the store any way you want. And you do, no longer have to worry about legal, you don't have to worry about advertising. You don't have to worry about accounting. We will do all of that for you. You just become, be a pharmacist, hire your people, and run the store the way you always have. And in addition to your regular salary that you're taking now, I'll give you 10%. And that's how I bought one store. Sometimes I buy a chain for 10 stores. And that's what I did. And most of those pharmacists, interestingly enough, were amongst the wealthier people in their communities because they started off with a pharmacy and then bought the store across the street and then bought the building down the street. So uh, it was a very interesting time. <laughs> that is very interesting. It's, you know, it, it seems like things moved really quickly um, from, from the way that you're telling it. Um, were there any fuck ups that happened along that journey? I'm sure there must have been, been some. Many, or <laughs> I'm trying to think of, uh, of the major one. No, I, I had a lot of fuck ups in some other businesses that I was in. This one I did, I, the odd time I would buy a store that didn't do as well um, as it could have. And the odd time I learned very quickly that, for example, you never buy a pharmacy without a park, without parking. If there's no parking, everybody goes to the closest store to their pharmacy, to the closest pharmacy to their house. Nobody passes a pharmacy unless there's no parking. So that's one little thing. But um, my fuck ups were bigger than the other businesses that I was involved in. <laughs> tell us about, yeah, why don't you tell us about one of those? And before you dive into it, just want to remind everybody who's watching on Facebook Live, um, don't forget that you can ask questions as well. We really want to make this interactive. So if you have any well, questions you want to ask, just pop them in the comments and we'll get to them um, towards the end of this talk. This is a fuck up which, which taught me not to just base everything on statistics. In addition to General Electric and in addition to Dilex, I also worked for any of you who remember the T. Eaton Company. The T. Eaton Company was the equivalent of, of today's Walmart, I guess, in Canada. It had 25% of all volume, all retail in Canada. And I was a senior executive responsible for hard lines. In other words, everything except fashions, as you can tell by the way I'm dressed. <laughs> and and um, one of the, the departments was mattresses. Nobody else sold mattresses. It was Eaton's and Sears sold mat mattresses. And I called in the buyer one day just to get a review, to get an understanding as to what's going on with mattresses. And he showed me how many SKUs there were. SKUs meaning stock keeping units. How many different mattresses? I said, that's crazy. <laughs> Hundreds. I said, that's crazy. They had different ticking. Ticking is 
the cover on the mattress, you know, the, the fabric that you yeah. see. So I said, look, I'm going to give you six months. I want you to reduce the number of SKUs by 50%. Our sales went down 50%. <laughs> it just shows you, because it didn't make any sense to have that many, it meant all of that inventory that we paid for, that we had to continue to keep in our, but nevertheless, that's the way that business was run. So that was one thing that I really screwed up. There were other departments that I did things like that as well. But the lesson I learned is use more than just statistics in making a business decision. What else could you have done um, to kind of make that decision? That would have been a, a smarter... Yeah, speak, to other people, speak to other people in the industry. Speak to the manufacturers who know exactly what's selling as far as their line is concerned. Speak to the competition. Speak to the salespeople on the floor. They, they know more than most executives or most managers because they're there dealing with the consumer. For sure, yeah. Um, so these right now are, are pretty interesting times for retail. I think it's, you know, it's a very polarizing time. Um, there's, you know, some retail um, stores and brands that are doing really well through all of this and they're so in demand. And then there's others that are really struggling. Um, how do you sort of see the future of, of retail evolving? Is there, is there anything that you can, you can share with, with our audience? Yeah, I'll just give you my opinion. It's not based on any kind of research that I've done, but re retailing, like every other industry, has been evolving dramatically over the past 50 years, specifically the last 20 years. Not that about computers, that nobody had computers at that time. They were no stores at that time and where we are now with computers. Well, the change that's in the process of taking place now with COVID is probably going to accelerate the rate of change in every industry, specifically uh, retail. And a lot of independents are going to fall by the wayside, unfortunately. So on the one hand, it's an opportunity for those who stay in because there'll be less competition. The big guys will get bigger and they'll continue to be competitive, either online or in bricks and mortar, but there still will be independence. So I look upon, I look upon the situation as an opportunity for smaller independence because of less competition. But in order for them to be successful, they better have a product or a service that nobody else has. Because if they're gonna have the same kind of product line in their store, they're not gonna have the lowest price because the big guys are gonna have the lowest price. They better have either products that nobody else has, or they better offer the kind of service that not only can the big guys not provide, but even the little guys, and I say guys, when I say guys, I mean men and women, I'm not, being, I'm not picking one or the other. But, I think there's an opportunity if you really know what you're doing as a retailer and you offer specific uh, products and services. Yeah, that's that's a really good point. I think you know right now um, there's there's an outpouring of support for small business. There's a great initiative that the city um, is spearheading in partnership with uh, with Shopify and with a bunch of other tech players and um, the Schulich School of Business getting um, students to help with actually getting a lot of these small businesses that didn't have an online presence before, um, helping them get online, helping them kind of move through that process um, more quickly than they could have just on their own without that experience. I think another huge thing is, you know, having, having a great brand, um, having a story, you know, really showcasing um, why this business was started, the founding story. I think people really kind of gravitate towards that as well. And that could be something that sets you apart as well, aside from, you know, having something unique and aside from pricing. I think if people gravitate towards your story and your mission, that's, that's definitely um, something else that I think is important. How did you, um, when you were deciding to start Steel's People, you were the first, you know, store of that kind. Um, how did you kind of overcome that fear to get into it when, you know, you, you didn't know, you knew that you had something different, but you didn't know exactly how it was going to be received and it was definitely a big risk? Um, yeah, how did you kind of get over that? Well, first of all, I was totally dependent on my brother's experience because I didn't have any experience. <clears throat> either as an operator or having been in the industry. He was, and he explained to me, he was so convinced that people were going to have computers in his home that I really, I really subscribed to what 
he thought the future would be. However, despite the fact that I was totally um, convinced that it was the right thing to do, you'll notice that at, for the first few months, I didn't quite enjoy him. So I sort of was sitting on both sides of the fence, <clears throat> more on his side of the fence, but I was afraid to let go, but I finally did and left what I was doing and joined him. But it, it had to do with my really believing that there was a future for that product and that nobody else was doing it. And yeah. some people would say, if nobody else is doing it, that there must be a reason. Yeah. I took the opposite approach and so did my brother. That's awesome. Yeah, sometimes you just have that gut feel and you do your research and you calculate your risk and you just go for it. That's really great. So um, again, a reminder, if anybody has questions, don't forget to pop them into the comments. So you mentioned that, that you know you retired a while back. Um, what did that journey sort of look like? How did you, you were so you know ambitious and so you've done so much throughout your entrepreneurial journey and through your career. How did you make that decision to retire and what was that process like and what are you involved in these days i know you still you know you're on a few boards you're you're doing quite a bit of um community outreach and support so tell us a little bit about that well i'll tell you you asked me how i decided to retire <clears throat> and i told this story many times i have to otherwise i would forget but i remember being for those who are watching who are from toronto i was at the corner of saint Clair and Bathurst, I was driving north and it was bumper to bumper. And I remember at that time, when you're, you're sitting doing nothing, all kinds of things go through your head. Two of my friends, one close friend and one a friend of a friend who I also knew, both had cancer. That's not a nice subject to talk about, but you asked me a question how I decided. That was on a Wednesday. I decided at that point in time, I was 64 at the time. I decided life is short because those people, the day before they found out they had cancer, they were doing the same thing as me. They were going out on Saturday night. They were doing whatever, they did, visiting their grandchildren. That was the day before they found out. Then the day they found out, that was the end of their life, the beginning of the end of their life. And I said, you know what? I can afford it. I still have the energy. I'm going to leave. That was on a Wednesday. I left on a Friday. And I came home and my wife didn't believe me for a few weeks. <laughs> That's how I made that decision. That's really what caused me to make that decision. So you never know what kind of events cause you to make various decisions. I don't mean just on retirement, I mean on anything. For sure, anything there, you don't know what the next catalyst is gonna be for, that's gonna yeah. completely change your life. It could be, it could be anything. And what did you do in, in the, you know, you retired? Did you take the opportunity to travel? Or what did that initial well, year look like? Yeah. Well, um, of course, my wife said to me when, when she finally accepted the fact that I retired, she says, what are you going to do? I said, I have no idea. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, but what I did do is I immediately decided I want to get involved in giving back. I know that's corny, but I really wanted to do that to the best of my ability. And coincidentally, somebody called me that very week and asked me, if I'd be interested because he was on, on the board of the Heart and Stroke Foundation and he asked me if I would join, if I would be interested in being considered uh, for the board. I said, yeah, sure. And uh, I did. And I became the chair of Heart and Stroke and I did that for a while. But ever since then, I've been on, on for-profit and not-for-profit boards for the last, ever since I retired. I still am on, on some boards. And I, I get a lot out of that because not only I don't know how much I contribute, but I can tell you all of the people sitting around the table at the various boards that I participate in, I learn so much. I learn so much from them. And it's also a very good feeling, not only that's from a selfish perspective, but it's a very good feeling to be able to help whatever those not-for-profits are doing. Yeah, uh, that's Heart and Stroke was the first one, but I've been on many since. That's so fantastic. That's, I'm sure, you know, personally for me, that's definitely a big um, career goal of mine, you know, to eventually sit on, sit on a board that I'm really passionate about um, and to really help in our organization in that way. And I'm sure a lot of people that are tuning in who are, you know, young professionals or, or entrepreneurs themselves, that might be something that they're thinking about as well. Um, to be honest with you, I have no idea how to even go about it. What would be the first step to how do you get on a board? And well, it, it's that? the word that you probably haven't heard in this conversation, it's called networking. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but that's the way to do it. Find people who are on board, uh, on a board, a board that you might be interested in, and just ask them, you know, what, ask them all the obvious questions. 
how do I go about getting on a board? What do I have to do? Who should I mix with? What, or maybe you can join a committee of a board. Every board has various committees and those committees are made up of people who have specific expertise. So there's all kinds of people that are involved in this particular video that we're producing that uh, have all kinds of expertise that can serve various board committees very well. All kinds of board committees. That's very true. So I'm just looking through some questions that are um, that are coming through. Um, so we had some that came through on Instagram as well. Um, okay, so some of these we've kind of gone through. Um, okay, so there's somebody, there's a question from Mr. Persistence on Instagram. Um, what is the best advice when trying to secure a physical location for retail? Uh, uh, it's called... The old, the old uh, term is called footsteps. In other words, how many people pass your store? And it, it, don't, don't worry about the other side of the street. It's got to be on the street where your store is located. So how many people actually pass your store? And is it the right kind of, of, of uh, environment or the right part of the city, if it's a large city, is it the right, it, is the neighborhood are they, are they the kind of people who would buy the kind of products that you want to sell? So you've obviously got to select the area where the, pe where the people living there would be susceptible to, would be interested in the kind of product you're selling. So that's number one, obviously. I think everybody knows that. And the next thing is sit out there for a while and, and measure how many people are going by. You know, you don't have to stand there and people are going the number of people that are going by. Don't just do it on that street. Take a few streets. You might be surprised. You might be surprised how many people pass on certain streets who might be interested, but it has to be the right demographics for that store, for that product in a store. Yeah, that's really good advice. You know, it doesn't have to be, of course, there's a lot of research and things that you have to do, but it, it doesn't hurt to go in person and check it out. Um, another question that came through from Eric. Um, Oh, I'm sorry. So the question that he had was, um, when you're starting a new role in retail, um, how can you really make sure that, you know, you're learning quickly and you're, you're being successful? Well, uh, I, I don't know how you, it depends the kind of product that you're selling, if yeah. it, you know, and, but there's a lot to be learned about every product. Even if you're, if you're selling, um, clothing, you should know a lot about the product. In other words, as much as you can possibly learn about whatever you're selling, I mean, if it's a technological product, that's a whole different one, but nevertheless, learn as much as you can. That's number one. Number two, I don't know about the people listening in or watching. I don't know if they keep going back to a specific store for a specific product because of a salesperson, but I can tell you, that I only go to stores where I really have a relationship with a salesperson for two reasons. He or she really knows what they're talking about. So I'm respectful of that. And two, that they really care about me continuing to be a customer of theirs. And if you can actually develop a relationship with a customer or customers, they will keep coming back, but more important, when you're working in a store to start off with as a salesperson, the manager or the owner of the store will soon see, you won't have to tell him or her anything, that the people keep coming back and asking for you. And I think the two things that which really set effective salespeople apart are their knowledge of the product and the way they um, relate to the customer. So that's for salespeople. I'm assuming this person was asking from a sales person perspective. It wasn't clear, but that's, that's really great advice. Um, and another question that came through from Jessica, I like this one a lot. Um, how do you define failure? What does the word failure mean to you? I guess the positive way of, of defining failure is it was a situation that enabled you to learn what not to do again. Love that. That's yeah. It's just it's just an experiment. I mean, maybe I'm, maybe I'm being superficial, but I, I think that's one. That's what came to my mind immediately. Yeah, you know, an, another question that I have is, um, you know, with a lot of our, our talks and a lot of the failure stories that we hear, 
um, as an entrepreneur, you know, your ego is so tied to your business and your identity is so tied to it. And if it fails or, you know, you fail in, in the role that you're working in, it's really hard to not see yourself personally as a failure. How did you kind of overcome that? And um, how were you able to separate yourself from the business? Yeah, well, a couple of things come to mind when, when you ask that, when Jessica asked that question. Number one is up until the time that you failed with whatever your business is, I have no doubt whoever that person is will recognize that until that point, they really accomplished quite a bit to get to that point. You know, they, if it's a retail store, they found the location, they hired the people, they had relationships with their suppliers. All of these things took effort and took personality. So when you fail, it's not the end of the world. Look what you've already accomplished. And look what you've learned from that. You've learned all of the good things. You've also learned some things that you shouldn't have done if you're objective. And it's so important to be objective. And it's so important not to blame other people. I mean, I only know one president of the United States who, who blames people. I don't, I don't know too many people who blame people for their mistakes. But as far, as far as I'm concerned, you've accomplished a lot. You've learned a lot. It's time to move on to the next step. And when you go to either borrow money or to find people to work with you, they will see that you've already had that experience. And they're, not, they're betting on somebody who's already done something successfully, even though it didn't work out at the end. That's really great advice. That's, I think that's fantastic. And I think anybody can really apply that, whether you're an entrepreneur or a young professional or, or a little bit of both. Such great advice, Barry. So I don't see any other questions that have come through and we're getting close to the end of our talk anyways. So I just wanna say a huge thank you again for sharing your story, for sharing all those great lessons. Um, any last words, any, any more advice that you wanna to give to our community? I don't have any more advice other than I enjoyed this conversation even though I, I did a lot of the talking. <laughs> all of the things I say, said apply to other professionals, whether they be lawyers or doctors or accountants, uh, it all applies. It all applies. Absolutely. But, I think so you, thank you for the opportunity. Again, thank you so much for sharing your story. Um, so just to wrap up, again, I want to say thank you so much to everybody who tuned in. Um, really appreciate you um, coming on and supporting us in this new format on Facebook Live. It's been really fun to interact with our community in this way. Um, I want to say a huge thank you to our lead partner, Zero, one more time. Um, so really, again, if you're a small business owner, if you're an entrepreneur, very important that you stay on top of your cash flow right now and make sure that you're using a great uh, cloud accounting platform. So we recommend Zero. We're going to post the link in below. They're offering a free trial and you can also sign up for a demo. Super easy to use. It helps you focus on the most important parts of your business rather than just getting tied up in the accounting side of things. So definitely recommend checking them out. Also, if you've ever been to one of our in-person events, um, you know our fuck up wall, which is um, where you can write down your fuck up anonymously on a post-it. You could share it. We've taken that virtual as well. So hop on Instagram, search up at fuck up wall, and you can either take a look through the fuck ups that have been submitted. But I would recommend, of course, sharing your own failure story with us. You know, you've heard Barry's failure story. You've heard me share some fuck ups. Um, you've heard some of our past speakers share stories. So now is your chance to write your fuck up down. If you don't have post-it notes at home, you can download the post-it app and you can have some fun with it there.